Welcome back. So um, before we work out and try to understand all of these interesting nonlinear behaviors, I thought it would be helpful to maybe recap what makes a linear system linear, as this will help us to understand why linear systems can't describe these more exotic behaviors and um, set the scene for some of the notation and types of things that we're going to be using for describing the nonlinear world. So let's just remind ourselves what a linear system is. So you may have had this presented uh, to you in a slightly different way, maybe in transfer function form, but uh, for our purposes we're going to say that a linear system is a set of differential equations on this particular form here. And I hope this looks familiar. So this um, variable x, this is the state of the system, and this sort of describes its configuration. So if you imagine you're describing the model for a robot, um, this vector x will contain all of the lengths and angles and things in the joints as well as their velocities. And so the idea is the state is a sort of a minimal description of the configuration of the system. Y is some vector of outputs of interest, so maybe it's things that you can measure about your system, or maybe it's things that you're interested in uh, keeping an eye on. Um, so, I don't know, if you had a very large uh, building to describe all of the dynamics of the building, you might need a very um, large state vector x, but you might only be interested in the temperatures in the room. And those temperatures will be some of the states, but um, there'll be m many other states as well. So y gives you sort of a reduced description. And this vector u, this, um, these are the signals that we can apply to our system to sort of make it do what we want. So this would be the typically called the actuators of your system. So if you're describing a car, your actuators might be um, how hard you press on the gas pedal or the brake pedal or how you use the steering wheel. These are your inputs or actuators and they will affect um, the behavior of the car. And the idea is that this linear differential equation should be able to describe that behavior. Um, as I said before, you would probably have had this presented to you um, maybe in transfer function form, but hopefully you've, you'll have already seen this before. But the way I want you to start sort of thinking about these systems is as mappings from initial conditions and inputs to what the system does. And this will have been implicit in things that you've been taught before, but let's make it a bit more explicit. So as a uh, mapping. So what does this differential equation actually mean? It means that given certain initial conditions, so given what the state is equal to at time t is zero, and given a set of inputs, the differential equation will predict into the future what the system does. And so what does that mean? Well, it means if we're given our initial condition and we're given some input, this differential equation will just tell us or make a prediction about how the system is going to behave in the future. And the, the prediction about how it's going to behave in abstract terms is captured by what happens to the state and the output for a time t greater than zero. So sort of underneath the hood, the, the, the point of this differential equation model is to make predictions and written sort of abstractly, that means given some initial conditions and given some inputs, it will tell us what we think the system is going to do in the future. Um, and indeed, for linear systems, there's even a nice formula for this mapping. So this is a formula you will have seen before. There's probably never been any emphasis put on it. It's not particularly important. The only real point I'm making here is that we have this mapping, and that's really what the differential equation is telling us. Um, and that formula, just for completeness, it looked something like um, x of t is e to the a t x of zero. So this thing is the matrix exponential. The details aren't important. Um, and then plus some convolution integral, which, yeah, looks probably like this. And so this was our formula for telling us what the state is at future times based on the input and the initial condition. 
And similarly, um, the output was just given by uh, exactly the same equation. So given the input and given our solution for the state into future times, we also know what the output is. So we had an explicit formula for this uh, mapping. Um, but why, why are these systems called linear? Um, now, I don't, I don't know if you remember, but uh, probably way back a long time ago, you were told that systems are linear if they satisfy two properties. And those properties, I don't know what they were called, maybe superposition and some kind of scaling. Um, so what does that mean? And why does the linear system satisfy linearity? What is making it linear? So let's look at property one. So property one was superposition. And intuitively, what does this mean? So again, let's draw some axes. And here we have time. And let's say that we're plotting y on the y-axis. So we're assuming y is scalar. This is more general. Things can be, y could be a vector. But let's just, for the intuition, let's just say um, that it's a scalar. And so what does superposition, superposition say? So suppose we have one solution for a given initial condition and set of inputs, and it looks like this, say. And let's say we have another one for another initial condition and another set of inputs. It looks like this. This is y2. So to make that a bit more explicit, what we're saying is that when x, um, x at time 0 is equal to um, some initial condition x1, and uh, u is equal to some particular input u1, then we get um, a solution x1 of t and y1 of t. And we get the same thing for our second solution. So if our initial condition is equal to x2 and our input is equal to some other input, then we get x2 of t and y2 of t. And now superposition tells us that we are able to add these solutions to get uh, add these initial conditions to get a new solution um, in the following way. So if superposition holds, then if we add these initial conditions up, the solution we get, we get just by adding the solutions up. And that's what it means for superposition to hold. So that says that if we um, now initial, initialize our system with initial condition x1 plus x2, and with input u1 plus u2, then we'll get the solution x1 of t plus x2 of t and y1 of t plus y2 of t. And so on our picture, that would mean if we apply this uh, superimposed initial condition, the output we would get, we just get by adding these two signals up. And we do that pointwise in time. So that would mean that for this combined um, input and initial condition, we would start here. And then it looks like we're always, when we add up, um, in, it looks like maybe we would go up something like this for these points, and then maybe come down and sort of wiggle around here. But so this is supposed to be y1 plus y2. So this is the principle of superposition. And a little challenge for you, maybe uh, c. Can you just see directly from this formula why superposition must hold? Um, but this is a property of linearity, and it's one of the things that makes linear systems linear. Um, and the other property, I don't know what this one is called. It's, like, it's probably got a fancy name. But property two um, is like this scaling. Or let's just call it a scaling property. Um, and what does this one say? Well, if we have all the same setup, we draw our axes again. Um, and then, so here we have y, here we have time, and this is a particular solution, y1. Um, and so, as before, y1 is given by um, this uh, 
let's just say this set of inputs and initial conditions. So x of zero is x one, uh, u um, of t is equal to u one, and that gave us x one and y one all of t. Then scaling says if we just scale those initial conditions and inputs by a factor a. So if I put in an a here, ah, no, not there. Okay, let's write it out. So if we scale things, so now if we look at x0 is equal to maybe our factor a multiplied by x1 and u of t is equal to a multiplied by u1, then our output will be scaled by the same factor. So we get a x1 of t, a y1 of t. And so what would that look like? So suppose a is equal to a half. Um, this would say that if we now apply the initial condition and inputs scaled by the factor half, our output is also scaled by the factor of a half. So we'll get something like that maybe where this distance is always a half of this distance at every point through here. And this is our second linearity property and again it's fairly quick to see why this holds from the explicit formula um, for um, x of t and y of t here. So what's the point of all of this? Well, it turns out that property 1 and property 2, so superposition and scaling, are already enough to mean that we can't possibly have limit cycles. We can't possibly have only finite regions of attraction of equilibrium points. We can't possibly have systems with multiple equilibrium points. And we're going to dive into that in a few examples in a minute. But um, So just by understanding these defining properties of linearity, you're able to see immediately that linear systems can't produce these interesting behaviours and that we're going to have to study something more complex um, in order to be able to explain and understand those behaviours.